Hello, I'm Neil Moody and welcome to this special podcast episode where I'm joined today by two wonderful guests. My first guest is TV presenter, model and ambassador for Wellbeing for Women and Children's Air Ambulance, Rosie Tapner, who is to my left. And my second guest is award-winning charity founder, multi-published author, public speaker and internationally renowned barber, Tom Chapman. In the middle, for those that can see. The idea for this episode came about after the publication of research from the Iron Mongery Direct in collaboration with Mind. Recent research by Iron Mongery Direct in collaboration with Charity Mind has shown that male construction workers are three times more likely to die from suicide than the average UK man, and half of UK tradespeople experience mental health issues due to work. The survey highlighted financial worries as the top cause of the issues, especially during COVID. Just a few facts. More females attempt suicide than males, but more men die by suicide. Men aged 40 to 49 have the highest suicide rates in the UK. Men report lower levels of life satisfaction than women, according to the government's National Wellbeing Survey. Men are less likely to access psychological therapies than women. Only 36% of referrals to the NHS talk therapies are for men. Nearly three quarters of adults who go missing are men. I also wanted to mention before we start that I just um, recently had a conversation with a family member of mine who another family member approached them and said that they were suffering from mental health issues. And when they were asked if they had gone to get any help, they said no, because men brush it under the carpet. And that is another reason that spurred me on to do this particular episode. As you can imagine, I was pretty... Not furious, I don't want to say that's the wrong word, it sounds a bit aggressive, but I was annoyed that that was the comment that came out of his mouth, that men brush it under the carpet, because I think that's the wrong thing to do. I want to start the conversation with you both. Do we feel that the conversations going on about male mental health and suicide are having an impact, or is it something that we only seem to talk about in cosmopolitan bubbles, so like London, New York, the big cities, um, but it's not reaching the suburbs and smaller towns? What do you guys think? Well, you probably know more than I do on that, that point. But I'd like to say that's incredibly sad, those facts that you've just read out there, because, you know, to think that more women try suicide, but actually more men succeed, hmm. shows quite rightly that they don't cry for help. They they just go for it, which is, <clears throat> you know, and often women is a cry for help and they can talk it through. I'm, I'm just generalising there. But men seem to get to that point of they haven't spoken, they haven't spoken, they haven't spoken it gets worse and worse and worse and then they they end up at rock bottom and mm. and not saved which is just awful and i do wonder it's a good question you whether it's it's staying around the london areas and new york areas all these sort of big cities and not making its way out to the country and mm. into smaller suburban areas what do you think so from being from devon um and recently being at the devon county show doing uh, working with well, two two days we were there. We worked with the Young Farmer Stage one day, and we worked with Devon County Council the other day. And you know what? The impact in agriculture is massive. Obviously, farmers work by themselves. It's very isolated. They have access to heavy machinery. They have access to guns. They have um, lots of issues. You know, like the weather can cause massive problems. I mean, mm. it's not many industries where you plant a million quid in the soil and hope fingers crossed that you may just about make that back again with some profit Mm. so it's very high pressure and i think you know agriculture is very problematic with suicide it it, it is getting talked about i think something that we do being in the hair industry is it makes it accessible to others so you know we went to young farmers and they can relate to having a haircut because they have to have a haircut so there is we are making steps in the right direction i think we just need to make sure that we just talk about it as much as possible and give people those skills and Do you think there's a, sorry, there's a problem there with talking about farmers being on their own. It's quite a manly, macho kind of thing to be doing. Do you think there's an issue with that as well, actually, that they don't want to be seen to be weak? You know, you're a farmer, you've got tractors, you've got guns, like you said. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Mm. personally, as a girl, I don't think there's any weakness in speaking, especially to a woman. I find that really endearing and actually really lovely if a man comes to you and actually says, 
I'm struggling yeah. and I need a bit of help. Mm. And I don't see, there's no weakness in that whatsoever. If anything, that's stronger and more scary than anything. But do you think there's that problem of I, being a macho kind of mm. thing to be doing? Like Which construction like as well. The, the construction, construction, construction too. Construction, yeah, exactly. You know, construction's got the highest rate of suicide of any um, any industry to a day. It's like, and you know, you think these things like um what you think of a farmer they they supply the they supply the country with food they've got the responsibility they feel like they've got to get on and do that that's their role and we talked about that before neil about mm. the job role and you fall into that you get on with your job and anything outside of that can't affect you because you've got something to do a role to play and the the, the um construction work you talk about you know imagine being a 20 stone scaffolder covered in tattoos going into work and saying to all the other lads on the on the on the site that you're struggling a bit, and mm. I used to work live with a plasterer, and the stuff they used to do to each other it was banter. Yeah, you know, it was actually just bullying and, mm. and being really nasty to each other. Can you imagine having that safe space to be able to talk about it? Because mm. they don't, and they're all in that same space where they're working on sites by themselves, staying in hotels, drinking, smoking, mm. whatever you know, and and. It's a really, really hard, masculine, toxic environment to be yeah. in. You well, make a good point. Sorry, Neil. You make a good point there about the banter between men mm -hmm. as well. That there's that kind of you walk into a room and someone will just swear at you or like just call you a name because it's banter between men. I had a friend at uni that that ended up him having panic attacks mm -hmm. and not being able to go out anymore and feeling like he couldn't come into the house because every time he did, although it was genuinely just a bit of fun banter, he's like, I'm fed up with it. Yeah. I'm not managing this anymore and I can't keep up to that level of banter and fun yeah. and mm -hmm. feeling like I have to be the the funny one i can't do that anymore mm. and it was just really interesting he went on a night out and had a full-on panic attack because it was just one thing after another and he was like why not be normal and talk about things yeah i suppose it's that fine line isn't it between banter and then like you say crossing over into bullying yeah which i think for a lot of men and women sometimes but i think for men especially the bullying side they don't think they're being bullish bullyish but actually yeah. they are because they they won't stop with this banter that keeps yeah. going on and on and on and it, the person becomes the target don't they of their fun yeah you know then other people join in because they don't want to be the the target so if yeah. you're having banter with some someone else i would probably join your side and because i don't want to be the one that's on the other end of it and yeah. actually banter is it's just bullying because it depends who you can, you know, I decide whether I'm being bullied or not mm. because it may how I feel emotionally about what you're saying to me or doing to me. If you tell me, oh, it's just banter, which is nonsense, it's, yeah. it's just an excuse. Actually, you're making me feel really bad now. Yeah. So actually, you need to realise that and, and realise the, the what, you know, mm. have some empathy with that person and stop it. But Tom, doing what you do, how do you think this can be helped more? I mean, I know it's such a hard question to answer. I know you're saying like, you know, having these conversations. I mean, how do you stop a bunch of blokes, in inverted commas, having banter with somebody but making them feel like crap? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's difficult because it's, difficult it's part of our culture, isn't it? I think it's the UK and the way we are and we, we just like taking the piss out of each other, basically, don't we? Yeah. And, and we're yeah. very good at it. But, you know, I think it becomes, a, it becomes a point where you have to go, actually, look, feel comfortable with saying, sorry, Neil, I'm not really comfortable with you saying that to me or I'm not really comfortable with you saying that to them. Yeah. I don't think that's right. And I think that's the only way we're going to stand up and make a difference with that and make people realise, and let's face it, we've all, we've all got emotions, we've all got mental health, we've all had suffered loss, had been bullied or had something said to us that makes us feel bad about ourselves. Mm. So we can all relate to it in a certain way and it's about just standing up and saying that and yeah. someone has to step in the line and, and just say, look, you need to stop that now, mate, because you're not making him feel very nice or you're not making me feel very nice. Mm. I suppose there's an element of, isn't it, the ones that go, oh, I'll just join in to be part of the gang. It's some of them actually going, you know what, this person's now starting to not feel great about this anymore. And it's sort of stopping the, the ganging up, isn't it, really? Yeah. You know, if I came to you and said I'm really struggling and everyone had, you had all been bullying or bantering around with me, you know, it's whether you then come to my side on your own and try and change 20 others or do you just stick with them and go oh she's you know she's fine she's she is actually fine just mm. leave it or as, as a man's side as yeah. well I think that's really tough and actually whether you say it at work or whether you say it at home as long as you say something surely the the next step is easier but that first step because I've had mental health problems in my past mm. um, from modeling and everything and actually I was at rock bottom and then as soon as I said something the 
like terrifying but the weight that came off my shoulders was enormous and the next step was like great and I've got a family member Neil we spoke about it, I won't say who but a family member going through the same thing mm. and he said the ne- he said struggling and he's now getting help and feels so much yeah. better yeah but it's tough yeah. yeah no it is tough Rosie I wanted to ask you actually talking about the issues that you had so you've now championed the conversation about body image as a model when you were modeling but have you noticed that this is a big topic for men too because I think you know Tom and I were talking earlier about how you know during lockdown he put weight on during lockdown I put weight on I've struggled with my weight for years it's gone up and down like yo-yos and I think there's an element with social media where you start feeling you know that you should look a certain way and it's but I think it's happening with men as well Mm. you know all these people working out and doing all these things and that's fine I'm not saying that that's a bad thing but it's it's i get annoyed with the people that are just there posing with their six pack and their you know (laughs) just you can't even watch emmerdale without someone taking their shirt off and they got a six pack (laughs) totally (laughs) but then you start going well you know is this whatever whatever they're expecting everybody to aspire to Mm. oh honestly it's i mean it's a whole time i can talk about this for hours on end it drives me insane instagram and the way people portray themselves there are two things i would say is one it's who you follow as to what your feed says, right? Mm, mm. So if you are having mental health problems, you'll often see, you know, if, as, a, as a man, if you're struggling, but then you you don't help yourself by following people with six packs and following people who only pose like that because mm. that's then what you're seeing on your feed. You could yeah. follow someone that's not like that and champions other things or has a hobby and you like that hobby. Mm. And I think that's really important is to take away your focus from the aesthetic of what someone looks like and actually bring it onto a focus of a hobby or something someone loves doing and follow the Mm. fact that they love doing whatever it might be and it's the same in my life that's how I changed I went from right stop thinking about what you look like Mm. um I was asked to a charity horse race and I had to get fit and I had to lift weights because I had to pass a fitness test which is near impossible to pass (laughs) and I had to lift weights and for the first time I saw muscle but I didn't look in a mirror for about a month I didn't think about what I was eating I was eating everything because I had to because I was in the gym Mm. and then suddenly one day I woke up and went oh my god I look like I look great but I feel more than anything amazing and Mm. not one part of this sort of journey has been about what I look like but it's really interesting on Instagram because I get so many mothers saying about their sons really which is interesting I've got a lot of girls as well but recently a lot of mothers have said about their sons as well particularly during lockdown because there's been that there's nothing to do so they do scroll on instagram and like you said people have put on weight or some people have really concentrated on the gym because that's been their Mm. you know help during lockdown but i think it's such a big problem for men and i think as a woman we need to start realizing as well as, as as much as our problem is a man's problem to help a man and and understand that they might be feeling like that i Mm. think some women, and I'm not generalising to all of them, might also have that banter attitude if, if someone comes to them and goes, I'm really struggling and, you know, I'm struggling with my weight and I'm struggling with the way I look like and just everything in life, for a girl to go, oh, man up. Mm. You know, and we get it as girls to say man up, but I think that's one of the biggest problems is to go man up. And actually, a friend of mine came to me the other day and said, I need to talk to you about something. And I was really busy at the time, but as soon because I knew that was a big step for him just to say... I need to talk, Mm. laptop down, phone off, cancelled all my meetings that day and I went, talk Mm. now Mm. and I want to know everything and nothing's off limits, you know you can trust me. And I think as a woman, it's also our duty and also our care to to give a man the opportunity and just anyone in life, Mm. if someone comes to you and says, I need to talk or I'm having a problem, don't bat them away. No matter what you've got on that day, just give them, even if it's 10 minutes and just Mm. say, we'll talk later as well don't bat that away because no. that might be their saving health mm. it's great that we're encouraging people to talk all the time it's everywhere and i know that we're in golf ourselves so within this mental health bubble but everywhere talk about it talk about it, talk about it but the problem is people are talking about it and people aren't prepared to already to listen they don't have those skills to listen and they brush it off and they'll say man up we need you to be the strong one or mm. you know we haven't got time or you brush it off and that person like you said has probably spent so much time building it up to be able to open up and tell you these things and then they're shut down which means they're probably never going to tell anyone ever again and then they end up doing something serious like taking their own life or self-harming or ending up not being able to cope with the mental health problems and it getting to a point where they're in I've been sectioned or they're in really, really bad, which, which could have been prevented if 
we were all ready to listen to each mm. other and not you don't have to fix or solve you can just say look i'm here to listen to you i may not understand but if There's you want to talk to me you, I'm here. you don't need to fix or solve it no. and no. you don't need to push someone to go to counseling or to do something just be a listening ear yeah. and actually mean it you know don't it's, sit it's on a, your phone don't yeah. sit on your laptop mm look at them mm. and listen to them and give them every time of day and give them a cuddle and let them know that they're loved and mm. that you're there no matter what but it's the people that go oh yeah yeah give me two minutes and just on my phone you're like, oh hold on yeah. a sec they've probably been thinking for weeks that they might come to you yeah, to talk yeah. to you mm. that was their biggest moment that was their terror of this is the next step for you it's nothing but for them it's everything and if yeah. you don't give them that time of day that's your problem yeah yeah it's an honor to be that person that they want to talk to i think it's absolutely. incredible yeah. absolutely do we feel that certain media figures and publications criticizing prince harry for example and recently olympians for being open about their mental health struggles is detrimental to the battle against the stigma I know for a fact that when when the the royals they opened up the brothers they opened up about their mental health with Diana I know that there was a huge influx in calls from men mm. to the helplines that day um, I can't remember the exact percentage I won't make anything up but there was a mass because people just go look if he can talk about it then I can talk about it and that, mm. and especially with somebody like that if there's it's it's making it relatable isn't it if there's a sports star or a musician or someone you relate to and look up to mm. and they openly talk about it i think that makes it accessible and easier for you to do it because you put them on pedestals and think well they must be having an amazing time because they're doing this and they're doing that but mm. if they can open up about it and i think that's it, why it's so important to have conversations like this mm. in this day and age you know you're looking at um everyone else's stuff you're not just keeping up with the joneses next door neighbors mm. looking at their grass is your grass as green as their grass and all the rest of it now we've got the, you talk about instagram you're looking at your friends your friends are all getting promotions i mean you might have had the best day in the world you're like i'm gonna have an amazing day today mm. been with neil this morning doing this today um you know we're, we're off to do some stuff on radio later blah blah blah. you know it's gonna be a great day mm. but i could go on social media later and one of my friends might have just I don't know, won the lottery or don't um, and I start going, Oh, that's not fair. They yeah. and actually I had a really good day if I focus on my stuff. I work mm. as a focus on me and you know, and that's what we need to do. And I think but it's like you said as well, celebrating it's great seeing other people succeeding. There's something so lovely about that. But I think we're not very we're not, good at, we're not good at that. Not, we're not here. Good at it. Compared no. to working in America, especially mm. men, I think there's yeah. a. Is there? I might be wrong. I'm a woman, so I don't <laughs> know. But is there a power shift in men? You know, if your best mate is seen to be to making it is more, is it a money thing? Yeah. Is it a um, support? You know, there's obviously but, well, traditionally. You, I would say, Tom, it's more secretly competitive. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. not so, yeah. so vocal. But you know then, what I mean? That underlying, there's a bit more of a, you know. <laughs> You've got a bigger house than I've got, or mm. that sort of thing of, you must be making more as a man, I think. But, you know, they're probably under more pressure. They're probably in more debt. They're probably, you know, yeah. struggling. They don't know. We don't actually know what's going on. We go into this, we look at the, the very sort of like, what we can see straight away. Like, they've got a nice house. They've got this, but they've all their credit cards are maxed out. They're struggling. They're fighting, fighting with their other half. They're, you know, we don't actually know. Um, that's why I think it's so important for us to focus on ourselves yeah. mm. and just be happy for other people. I mean, we're, like I say, we're not very good at it as no. a country. I think and you see someone driving a nice yourself. car. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's yeah. the other thing. Because like you like you just said, which is just so perfect, is that you see all the good things. You don't see the bad things because people don't tend to talk about it. This is mm. the problem, yeah. is that they might be suffering, but they might be in the most beautiful home with the beautiful family and everything but they might be really suffering yeah so i think um there was a documentary uh roman kemp's documentary i don't know if you saw it yeah which he said the best thing which was to ask someone if they're okay twice yeah, yeah. and just to say how are you and you go oh i'm fine i'm fine no but how ha are you how are you because yeah. you just never know no matter how amazing someone's life might look on instagram or in real life mm. you have no idea when they go to bed what they think about and I think that's important to realise, yeah, especially yeah. as a man, because I think as a man, it is harder to talk. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. As girls, we've grown up in groups where you chat and you're probably close to your mother or something. I don't know. But I think it is harder as a man. But from a female point of view, Rosie, what do you think wives, girlfriends and mothers can do to help men in their lives with this kind of thing? How would you say moving forward that this can improve? We need to blow out all those old age traditions of a man needs to man up and a man has to provide for his family and a man mm. has to do everything and have all the pressure on the world on his shoulders 
I do. I'm a very traditional girl. I'd love to be a housewife. (laughs) (laughs) I would. Me too. (laughs) I would. But I do think there's that. You know, there's so much pressure on a man nowadays that there just shouldn't be. Mm. And I think as a wife, mother, friend, whoever you are, to a to a guy, to be that listening and also to give them the time of day to talk. That's I think that's more important than even listening is allowing a time of day to talk. Mm. Whether it's in the evening, before you go to bed, whether you go to bed early and start talking about things. There's life is so fast. We were discussing before the podcast that things have opened up and we're all going, Oh my god, how did we used to do this? Mm. If you're not giving the time to sit down over a meal without your phone, without your emails going, yeah. and actually have a conversation. And I think now more than ever with things opening up, I know I'm anxious about things opening up and having to socialise again. It's been ages. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've forgotten how to do it. How to have a drink in a pub. Um, Mm. But I think there's that remembrance that things are going to be hard and we we kind of got comfortable in COVID Mm. to a certain extent and now we're opening up again. It's allowing that time. But yeah, as a a mother in particular, I'm not a mother, but allowing, (laughs) if you have children and you have a son, don't make them that, you know, you've got to man up. You've got to be the man of the house Mm. one day. And no matter what job you go into... You should be able to talk, but I know it's. I mean, it, it's hard talking it's about. It's a slow things. process, isn't it? I think of allowing this to get better over time, and I mean, I have to say, I hate the saying "man up." I'm like, I actually sort of when people say that, I go, "What do you mean exactly? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What does man up mean, really? Because it pff, man up is what, like, what show your muscles, or you know what I mean, or sort of pick up some weight. I mean, like, <laughs> well, you know, that stereotypical definition of man up. Yeah, yeah. I d- I, I think also there's a problem of the man up thing is obviously a problem. I shouldn't say it, but I also think we've all become very sensitive to every single phrase now used. Yes, you know, a Good Morning Britain do it quite a lot, and they say, you know, people are getting angry about every single tiny thing. Yeah. And I think it's it's a certain way that you take the phrase mm. right, but that is the problem. You don't know how someone's feeling, so if you said to them, man up, in normal life, you'd probably just brush it off and go, oh, ha, ha, yes, yes. Mm. But if you're the guy that's struggling and someone says that to you, that phrase will hurt. Yeah. And that's the problem with it. There's no problem with the phrase. It's who you've said it to. It's about, yeah, it's about being aware, isn't it? Self-aware and aware of someone else as being empathetic. And, you know, there was a uh, study done by Dr. Brene Brown, and she she studied um, shame in women mostly, and then she went over to study shame in men, but... She found that shame in men always came down to being seen to be weak. That was weakness was our issue, our problem. Mm. We'd rather die up on our white horse and get down off of it. But the thing is, she she found that when men were opening up to the women in their lives, the responses they were getting. I mean, I I can't remember. I won't you know paraphrase or anything, but the, they were really negative, and it was mostly around this whole thing: we need you to be strong, we need man up, we need to mm. you know. And actually, how damaging that was to the men. And I don't think, like I said to you, Neil, I don't think it's because people genuinely wanted to upset like you just said well i'm not aiming to upset you or put Mm. you down it's because we're not comfortable with it we're not comfortable as listeners or responding to those sort of situations we're uncomfortable with seeing men in that situation and that's the next step these men are opening up and talking we need to be ready to listen and we need to Mm. thank them thank you for talking up to me i don't know what to say i don't understand but i'm here if you need me and that's that's the next step Mm. we really need to do it's that response and especially from women if there's any women listening to that let the men in your life know. Yeah, totally. I love it. I love looking after. <laughs> like, if you have a problem, great, come over to yeah. me. Let's sit you down with a <laughs> do hot you chocolate. Think, Rosie, you know, saying that. Cool do you think as well, because there's become much more, you know, with women wanting to be of an equal as well, that it's almost like there's a thing with, like you say, you like looking after, but there's a lot of women now that are a bit like, I don't, I want to be the breadwinner. I want to be the person that's out there doing the better job than the husband or the boyfriend or whatever and so there's that fine line isn't there of like yeah you know you make such a good point because (laughs) us women are like we want this we want that we want to work and we want to be have children and we want this and we want everything we want to be the bread we are (laughs) so (laughs) greedy we are so greedy (laughs) but i i think the transition i said this to someone the other day i feel sorry for men yeah. to an extent because your whole <clears throat> life yes women deserve equality and everyone you should be does, everyone does yeah. but it shouldn't be at the extent that now 
men are having to adjust to that too, right? We need mm. to give men a bit of a minute to go, okay, so I, and this is very traditional in my head, but you know, you might get married and, um, and then in traditional times you might think your your wife will be a housewife and look after the children and now things have changed mm. and that takes time to adapt to yes, and you've got to allow the adaptation of the world currently which is changing so fast mm. and we all have to sit back and go are we okay because yeah. things have changed yeah and it's hard for men because they used to be the breadwinners and now they're seeing their wives families whatever also being the, which, there's no problem yeah. with that no but at least allow a man to understand it and let them i mean god i'm gonna get in trouble for saying all this but like let a man look after you as well mm. seriously and let yeah. a, and as a man let a, let a woman look, look after, after you, you. Yeah. let yeah. each other look after you we are all strong and we are all weak as well yeah and when you have your weak moments there is nothing weak about letting someone bring you up stronger and yeah. that's the main point yeah, it's almost like saying, you know, the the women have come up to become equal, but then the men also need to come up from this, like, we're the alpha male, we don't talk about this, we don't talk about that, we just stay strong, and da da da, da. It's almost like equalising both sides, isn't yeah, it, really? definitely. So it's funny you should bring this up, you know, because obviously I speak to a lot of men, I listen to a lot of men, and it's something that comes up quite often, is this role that, like, men don't know where they stand. There's mm. this sort of, it's weird, there's sort of, in my head, I split into three. You've got people sort of like my parents' age who are, they've got that role, they knew where they stood, this was what men did, this is what women did, it was a bit simpler, you know, and then you've got the younger generation when I go to the universities and the schools and they're just like totally, yeah, I'll get whatever, Do you know what I mean, they're open to anything. And then it's sort of transitional generation in the middle. And I've seen it a lot with a lot of my friends, especially if they sort of split up, got married young or whatever, and they're trying to date again and they don't know what to do. Like, am I, should I buy her a drink? Should I, I pay the for the meal? Do, do I do I? this? Do I yeah. not? Am I going to upset them? Um, and and they're, 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 a lot of these guys are just confused. Not They're not like, they're not pissed off about the fact that women want to be, mm. No, but quite know, rightly they're like, confused. They don't know what to do. And if they if they do buy a drink, it's just a weird, it's just a weird sort of uh, mind space for men, I think. Because I, I know a lot of girls that will go, oh, the, went out with a guy last night and he offered to pay and then he opened the door for me and he carried my bags. I'm so cross. Like, sorry yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> that's lo- like let a gent like that's a, just a gentleman yeah. and you can do the same back yeah but why not we're losing the I mean, lovely messages, gentle there? it, there's it, so it's many especially messages in, like media and stuff things like love island and oh i can't stand love island oh i know so i haven't it. even switched it on no I can't can't stand it that's another that's another conversation <laughs> another altogether <whole> <laughs> Going back to the public figures and talking about mental health and everything else, do we feel, whilst it's great that they're talking about it and, you know, for example, like Prince Harry and Prince William talking about their mother's death um, and then other celebrities talking about their problems, do you think they're talking enough? Because like you said, Tom, when Prince William and Prince Harry started talking about what they went through, there was an influx of people phoning men, especially kind of going, duh, duh, duh. but then does it suddenly wane and disappear once that program's over and done with? Like, how do we, how do we keep it going? And do you think they're doing enough to keep it, keep the conversation going and still making people make those phone calls or talking to somebody? Because I always worry that it becomes like a bit of a flash statement here and there, you know, and obviously, you know, Harry and William are, to individuals that we have no idea what their lives are really like but you know are they harry's buggered off to la <laughs> william's still here and i feel like now william's more prominent in terms of what we see and him still talking about mental health my thing is is are they doing enough to keep keep the conversation going regularly and not just them but other people as well I think there's more and more people talking about it now. I think mm. it's become very fashionable to come on trend. I think, you know, the danger now that I've had flagged up to me a few times, and people have said to me, do you think they're genuine? Or do you think they're just doing it because it's trendy or fashionable or whatever to talk about? Do you think, they're, do you think they actually care about mental health? Or do you think they actually have a mental health problem? And I think that's really sad that people are starting to question yeah. whether that's genuine or not. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that could be quite damaging to this whole mental health stuff if people are... If people are being gentler and they're and they're being questioned by it then that means that people are starting to go well i've heard too much about this now i don't want to you know i don't want to listen to any more of this mm. so i don't know can we can we can it be oversaturated can, i just think we just need to i think it needs to start younger 
Mm. You know, the mm-hmm. education needs to start younger. With I've got two young boys. I hope that by the time they're young men, mental health is something that they're just comfortable talking about. Yeah, like physical health. And it's is. not something that we're constantly <clears throat> like today. We're talking about it for a reason to try and get people talking about it. Hopefully, no one will have to preach about it anymore yeah. to yeah. get it talked about. Because I think Neil, like you said, is there enough being done? But like you know, if you go overboard, you start not being believed, mm. and you start people start getting bored of it mm. which is not the right attitude no. at all and you should you should always be believed if someone talks to you please always believe them because mm. you may see their happy life but you you just don't know so please always believe mm. but i do think there's that area of it's nice to see someone recover as well yeah and i incredible. think it's it's great to talk about it all the time but also it'd be really lovely to hear stories of recovery yeah. and people being happy and that will help. I, I've seen it with body image, in particular with like anorexics and bulimics and everything. Recovery, seeing people recover, mm. helps people who are in it because mm. they go, "All I'm looking at and all I'm hearing about is how people are depressed and how people are um, suicidal and it, constant, constant, constant." What I'm not hearing about is the people that have been through it yeah. and are now happy. Mm, yeah. And I think that is another stage we need to get to. Like, I mean, Harry and Meghan seem to be happy I have my different thoughts about everything mm. that went on but you know they when Megan said she was suicidal and that wasn't believed that was so detrimental mm. to everything but now she's happy and she's mm. living the life that she wanted to good for them mm, yeah. but good for everyone that does that but then be great to hear from people who have had real issues and then go but I'm really happy now because yeah. I spoke you know what you're right actually there isn't enough for want of a better word, celebration about people coming out the other side is there? There's a lot of talk about I'm in it, but you know, where's the talk about I've come out of it, I'm feeling better, maybe not a hundred percent, but I definitely feel like I'm over the worst, yeah. You know, and I, I almost feel that having those conversations more would help people that are thinking of suicide, yeah. you know, to know that there is a, an out. Uh, but the out isn't about killing yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a study that came out, um, I suppose, about 18 months ago now, and it was around how we talk about suicide, around how we talk about it safely, and and the and the impact of that. So, if you talk, uh, mostly for like the media as well, if you talk about suicide and you sensationalise it, you talk about method, means, location, that will actually cause two more deaths in that locality in 12 months after. Well, if that person is a celebrity, it's eight more deaths. If we talk about suicide and we talk about someone who took their life, we um, but we celebrate their life and we say they're an amazing person and we're really sad that they left and you can even say the word suicide. Those those stories are neutral and they mm. don't have any impact either way. But if we tell stories of celebration of people who have attempted and they've gone on, they've got success mm. afterward, they actually have a positive impact of saving two lives in that locality. Mm. So it is really important how we talk about these things, how we sensationalise things. The media have got a lot to answer for on how they talk about suicide. Um, they talk about being kind, they talk about all this other stuff, and then the next day they're slating people and attacking people. So yeah. it's really important. you know. And one of our friends, um, one of my friends, Paul, he was the first life that was sort of saved by Lions Barber Collective. He came and he spoke to me, and he, that conversation was enough for him to seek help. Mm. He's just had a kid. He's married. He he actually, you know, he's in, he's in the happiest place he's ever been. You know, and he, so he doesn't feel suicidal anymore, and he just and he's openly spoken about this loads of times. But stories like that are so important because they, you know, it goes to show that if I'm in that situation and he's done it, then I can do it. Mm. Like you said, mm. it's so important. Mm. And also realizing that you can get better, but also that mental health won't be something you think about every day. I mean, with my own problems with. I never had an eating disorder, but I had so many problems with modelling. I mean, I'm a, you saw me today, I cycle in, I don't need to look nice all the time, but I was always told you have to look a certain way, you have to be a certain way, and I found that really tough, and mm. it did get me into a really horrible place. I'm now after play, you know, and I was looking at food on Instagram and obsessed with it, and I put on, I went from 50 kilograms, I lost lots of weight and got down to 49 kilograms ended up in hospital and three weeks later I was 79 kilograms and took me three and a half years to get my metabolism back safely and healthily Mm. because of fluctuating so much I was miserable I'm now at a stage in my life I don't even think about mental health 
Mm. I don't need to. I'm happy. I don't think about food. I don't think about anything. I'm genuinely the happiest I've ever been. And that's really cool. Mm. But I want other people to get to that stage that... Because it, it does play on your mind when you're, you, you've you got mental health problems. I don't like to call them problems. Mental health illness. Mm. It does play on your mind constantly all day when you go to bed at night. And I think that's really tough for people to have and it's exhausting to have that but Mm. to know that you can recover to the point that you won't even think daily yeah oh is my mental health okay you just you will just live life just be and you'll just be and that's so Mm. exciting well i know when i was you know having my period of depression really heavy depression and anxiety i remember just feeling like it was so encompassing and it was all i could think about and it's actually really great when you can reach that point where it's not the first thing you think about when you wake up if you've actually managed to sleep because I didn't sleep for days Mm. Um, and I just remember lying in bed thinking I feel awful I feel awful I feel awful but to actually reach that point and this is one of the reasons why I've reached a stage in my life now where I can talk more openly about what I went through because I I like sharing the fact that I've come through the other side with people you know and sort of saying listen it hasn't I, I wouldn't say it's I've turned it off and it's gone away I've always likened um it's sort of depression and anxiety a bit like a dimmer switch where it sort of goes up and down but the problem is you don't have the fingers on the switch you know <laughs> that's really good <laughs> somebody else's fingers are on there gods or somebody you know what I mean but it is like that and you turn it up and down and I would never say that I wake up in the morning full of the joys of spring but I definitely don't wake up anymore and it encompasses my whole day and how I feel and I think that's a really important place to reach and to let people know that they can reach that point do, do you think that's because of it's just it's gone away with things because you've worked out ways of managing it better and ways of of, of you've learned skills to sort of yeah work I definitely it. learned skills I was taught skills uh, by some amazing people because I seeked help and I think you know those people taught me well one of the great things was they taught me that I wasn't going mad because that was the first thing that I thought <laughs> with my anxiety um, you know I. I've mentioned it before in other podcasts. My father had a nervous breakdown when I was really young and I watched him when I was 10, 11 years old, you know, and he tried to kill himself twice. And the second time I saw because it happened in our house in the middle of the night. Um, And so for me, I remember seeing that and those were things that I remembered when I got older and I was unwell, thinking I was going to be the same as him. And obviously it was 30, 20, 30, 20 years later, Um, that I experienced mine but one of the things they did say to me was is you're not your father you're only a product you're only a product of him Mm. so that doesn't mean to say what happened to him will will be exactly what happened to you yeah you're going through similar things but actually I don't think you're as bad as he got Um, but yeah I think I taught myself ways to feel better how to you know what I mean how to deal with if my anxiety was at a level where I just I mean I became agoraphobic I couldn't even go Mm. outside And just sort of getting over that was so difficult because I remember just thinking, I'm never going to work ever again. I'm never going to, you know, how am I going to ever support myself? But yeah, I think getting that help and getting that, uh, trusting the people that want to help you as well was a big thing. Because I remember I met one therapist and I was just a bit like, oh, I don't really like you. Yeah, you've got to find the right one. You've got to find the right one. And unfortunately, the first one isn't always the right one. But definitely... I think I taught myself a lot of tricks and tips and things like that, you know, and I took up sport as well. I played tennis, didn't you? Played tennis. Yeah. I mean, and I still do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Not brilliantly. (laughs) Doesn't matter. Nobody challenged me to a game. I like playing with my coach who can make me And you started doing Barry's as well. Yeah, I did do Barry's for a little bit, although I did, you started doing that, didn't you, as well, Rosie? Yeah, I've given up on Barry's too. Oh my God, that was too much. No. (laughs) stick to ride but you know even that i mean just knowing to go and do exercise is a great way to you know release endorphins and sort of for that feel good factor and actually my therapist originally got me to take up boxing which love boxing. i was just so like that is so not me but what was great was was that for me she said that it was um a good release because she was like you know what neil you're quite a big guy uh, but you're a hairstylist and you stand in one spot all day and just walk around a chair. And she was like, you're not exerting any energy, yeah. really. You're exerting mental energy, but not physical. And she was like, I want you to take up boxing. And I remember thinking, 
oh, she's picked the wrong person here. <laughs> but actually, it was the best thing that I ever did, and I loved it, and I did yeah. it until I tore my meniscus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which was about four or five years later. But it was a really good thing to have that as a tool as well. And it made me realise I need to go and do exercise. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's, about, it's about finding what's right for you. There's no right or wrong answer. Like everyone has their own, you can prescribe it to yourself. And like you said, it's not, you, connecting with others is really important. But I like to connect with others um, over a drink quietly. Well, other people might like to go out and have a wild night out, and other mm. people might like to go for a walk. And other people, so you know, those things are really important. Exercise, really important. Boxing is really good. It, whatever it is, what you're going, it could literally just be going, being active every day. It could be going to walk to the shop rather than get, taking the stairs, rather mm. than driving or getting an ev- elevator. It's just about making what's right for you. Because mm. like, if someone said to me that like, people always say, "Oh, going for a run's really good for your mental health," I absolutely hate running. Then don't go. So yeah. if, if if I said if I said that I'm going to go for a run, I'd put an alarm on in the morning. I'd be dreading it. It'd go off. I'd yeah. dread it. I'd do it. I'd hate it. And I, and I, pro- I probably wouldn't do it. And well, then yeah, I feel I guilty that's the worst for not thing. doing it. I was about to say that I used to do and I had to get out of that. I used to do a list every day of like 7:01 wake up, 7:02 brush your teeth, 7:03. And I was like literally to the point that I was going insane because I just went, "You're not getting anything done." <laughs> and so so if 7:04 went past and I hadn't had my breakfast, the mm. rest I would cancel the rest of the day because I'd be like, "Well, I missed that one, yeah. so I yeah. can't do the rest of it." And you'd put way too much in, and you make such a good point don't worry about what anyone else's tools are to help them mm. worry about your own yeah. whether that things. is and try different things so take people's advice you mm. know maybe running is good but if you hate it you don't have to like it no right. you don't have to like what anyone says and you need to be really wary about how other people like to be looked after and how they like to live their lives because mm. like you said so for someone it might be a night out with all your friends and you a spontaneous night out personally for me that night needs to be planned <laughs> i can't yeah. do it when a friend goes uh do you want to go down to the pub in five minutes i'm like whoa no i'd already planned a night in like mm, no yeah. i can't do that that is anxiety for me i but i what i can do is go right we've booked supper in the diary at someone else's house mm. it's, i'm the complete opposite space. <laughs> Rich, so you're the complete like, 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 come on yeah. and then i'll text everyone everyone's like no i'm busy because i've got a real life yeah. but i'm like you who does really <laughs> random stuff i'm like oh, right okay. it's just me but then that's Tuesday. so interesting isn't it yeah. because yeah. you do have different ways of coping and you've got to understand those different ways yeah, of coping of course, yeah. just look after my biggest thing is look after yourself but also look after how other people like to look after themselves yeah and don't try and change that because mm. if they're feeling a certain way and they know how to look after themselves don't try and change it yeah because they've got it no one likes being told what to do nah at all no. especially girls but we're very good at telling people <laughs> what to do aren't we we're very good very yeah we good. Find oh, we like, what to... you want to do is yeah, yeah. <laughs> when i went through it yeah i did this and that and actually mm. that's one of the things we've got you know we've i think we're all guilty of it we probably all say it to somebody at some point when someone's breaking down and you said oh, i know how you feel because don't when I went through that. this, oh, I understand because, and it's it's not nonsense because we will never understand. And I think the the whole lockdown and pandemic thing is a really good example of that because we've all been through the pandemic, We're, all of us, all three of us here. Mm. But I could never say that I understand what it felt like for you because my pandemic was completely different from your mm. pandemic, mm-hmm. although it was the same ex- experience for everyone. Yeah. So you know, when we say that, just just if you ever catch yourself saying that, stop and just say, look, I don't know what you're going through. I don't understand. But I'm here to listen and I will try to if you want to tell me. Never try and dilute someone's feelings with your, oh, I know how that feels. Yeah. And we yeah. do it all the time. I do it all the mm. time. Yeah, but I think we do it because we, I think sometimes we do it because we're not comfortable with them talking about it. So we kind of distract and go off and go, yeah. well, if I talk about my own thing, I can relate to that. So I feel comfortable there rather yeah. than mm. feeling uncomfortable listening to them tell me how bad they're feeling. That's a good point. Mm. Yeah. So true. I've had it as well, you know, when people have come to me and said, oh, I'm, you know, I've been having anxiety and I've heard you've talked about it and can we talk about it? And I noticed in the beginning, I used to say, oh, I know what you're going through. But then actually, I've stopped saying that now because I just say I've experienced something similar, but I don't know exactly what you're going through. But what I can do is try and help you and steer you in the right direction to try and get this resolved or improve it at least but yeah i've stopped saying oh i know what you're going through Mm -hmm. because actually i don't because their circumstances are completely different to mine my anxiety and depression were caused by certain things and other people's are caused by others and that's where it's different isn't it and also nothing changes overnight 
you're never going to get better overnight, I'm afraid. You know, mm-hmm. if you're listening to this and you're having problems now, I'm afraid it doesn't click overnight. It's a work, it's, you have to work it's on it. It's a work it. in progress. It's, ongoing, it's a work in progress and it will yeah. always be there. And from, you know, the day you're born to the end of your life, you always have to look after your physical health and your mental health. Mm. And if it's not good, you ask for help. It's so simple when you are fine. Yeah. But when you are not fine, it's the most complicated concept ever is to tell someone. But when you are okay, you're just like, well, tell someone, what's your problem? Mm. It's like, oh, but I'm having all these thoughts and I don't want anyone to not like me for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, That's the fear, isn't it? I, Joe, I think... With physical health, we all know that if we eat certain things and we exercise and we do this, and do, we know that our physical health will be better. We also know that physical health isn't just things like heart attacks, strokes, cancer. It goes all the way down to oh, well, a bit of a sniffle or a sore throat. And mm-hmm. we're comfortable and we know how to deal with that. Like if I feel rough, like we had a sickness bug the other week in our house, all the kids and I was like looking after them. We know how to look after that and care for that because mm-hmm. it's such a common place in our society if that's acceptable. But when we come to mental health, we think of it as something over there that other people deal with. It's a diagnosable term, like mm. bipolar, personality disorder, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and it's over there. But actually, we it's the same scale as physical health. We all have physical health. We all have mental health. We all have a brain. And actually, you know, we've all suffered loss. We've all been through things. We're all disappointed. We all have bad days. And I think it's just recognising that it's, it is a whole scale that we all have and not just something over there mm. that happens to other people. Mm. Yeah, And, and, and I think there's a... That, key thing of not throwing around the word depression Mm. or um ocd is another one i have someone who a friend who is actually ocd Mm. and that's an illness yes and that's a problem clean up a little bit yeah and i know you again it's one of those things it gets petty nowadays you say something someone gets cross you don't mean it but it is that thing of just remember who you're saying it to when you go oh i'm so depressed at the moment you might be saying that to someone who is actually Mm. you know clinically or um having to see the doctor about it which is not a problem that's a brilliant thing if you've you've gone to take that step but just be careful instead of saying depression oh i'm just having a low day mm-hmm. why yeah. not use that term instead of throwing the big terms around that you might not mean it you've been mm-hmm. educated on what those actually mean yeah, as well exactly. you know and, mm-hmm. and it's terminology you know like i remember when i was at school if you didn't like it you're gay everything's gay or he's gay, or he's gay. <laughs> and it's such you know it's just like they wouldn't even imagine it's not <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even say you wouldn't even say it now because we're educated on what that actually means as mm. people and people will say things like I remember oh well, this girl she's bipolar it's like what like yeah because she yeah. you know because sometimes she's happy and sometimes she's not it doesn't mean that she's yeah. bipolar or and actually understanding what those terms mean not using them in derogative mm. fashions you know and I, I think that's the issue and I think you know like we need to come forward with that mm-hmm. and understand yeah. what that is because these words just get banded about and they need to have little to no meaning yeah. Mm. Yeah, and also, but we, I mean, the other thing, the other side of it is, are we all becoming a bit too sort of sensitive about everything? But then actually, when you really think about it, no, Mm -hmm. because if people are having a problem and you're chucking around terms like that, that you have no idea what they mean, but they mean a lot to that person, that is a real issue. Mm -hmm. And so I know lots of people say, oh, we are becoming too sensitive. We can't do anything nowadays without getting told off. But just be aware, throw, you know, whatever you want to do if you know someone's okay but just be aware of who you're talking to because mm. someone said not that long ago you don't know your nasty comment or your throwaway oh depression or ocd or like you said gay or lesbian yeah. or whatever comment might be the last comment that sends someone over the edge mm. because they may have been bullied all that day they may have had comments all that day and for months and months and months and your first comment to them but might be the last one mm. that sends them over the edge. You've just got to be careful because it goes back to you that don't know. banter mentality, yeah. isn't it? That we were talking about in the beginning, and the slightly you have to be careful that it's not crossing over from banter to bullying. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's about it's, it's both ends, isn't it? It's about being aware and being empathetic of what other people feel like, and and be, just being self aware of yourself, but also building up resilience in yourself and what people say, and being able to. You know, put, let, let it go, you know, and just let mm. these things go and not dwell on these things because, you know, a lot of the time we, I, I can remember the, I think, I think guys generally, boy, I'm having two young boys, I think boys are better at that whole thing. I'll have an argument, have a scrap, and then it's done, and it's like, mm. okay, whatever. And I can remember being a Tony and Guy when I first started, and I was outside having a cigarette break back when, you know, it was okay to go and have a cigarette break in between every client. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
and one of the girls was walking along, or this girl was walking along the high street, and one of the girls that was with me, she was probably like five or six years older than me, she went, I hate her over there. And I was like, right, okay, this is this was a new experience for me as an 18-year-old boy with all these girls everywhere. And I was like, what happened? Went, well, in year seven, she did, I was like, what? You're like, wow. 20, you're like 25. Wow. You, I can't even remember any of year Holding seven. Holding a grudge all those years. why I always lived with about. boys at uni. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about letting easier. things go. Because that doesn't do, that doesn't, that, that woman, the little girl that she hated, probably didn't even know that she hated her. Mm. It's you carrying it around. So it's about letting those things go, letting, enjoying the good things and trying to get over the bad things as, as quickly and easy as you possibly can because mm. carrying that around doesn't help anybody. No. no. And you know what, guys, obviously, we could talk about this for hours. I think one of the main things for me that's coming out of this conversation is that it, we, we've got to be more educated mm. as human beings. And like you said, Tom, people, kids in schools, the parents educating their children more about these issues, these things that can happen and being more aware, I think, is what's really going to make these changes become more and more prominent over time, don't more you think? More normal. Yeah. And it's because I remember when I was at school, I mean, I remember like saying to you about my father, I just remember going, being at home thinking my dad's been weird. That's all I knew at the age of 10. My dad's behaving very strange. And then, um, you know, one day my mom went into the school and she told them what was happening and that he was actually going through a full mental breakdown. And, but after then, it was never talked about again, yeah. you know. And luckily, my mum was good enough to protect me from what was going on, but at the same time, feeding me enough information mm. to know what was happening. But I still think now, looking back, I wasn't really told enough to sort of take it on board and go... Especially as a young kid, because you probably um, go past the point of... You, you make things up in your head, right? Yeah. So if you're not told yeah. something, you catastrophize it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Even we more and more that. and more. We all do it yeah. all the time. So isn't it better to actually tell someone the truth? Yeah. And then they can deal with the truth mm. yeah. rather than catastrophize rather than it. Rather them. Which actually probably yeah. makes it worse. That's when you stay up in bed going, oh, what's happened? You yeah. know, what's but going I, on? Our inner voice. We listen to our inner voice more than any other voice in our Far lives, don't we? And it's... And it's not very nice to us most no. of the time. I did some, I did some work with I did some work with Ramesh Raganathan, and he he coined it perfectly. He called it his inner bastard, and it is so <laughs> true, isn't it? So true. Because you have a great, amazing day, and you and you your inner voice goes, "That was shit, Tom. Yeah. You could have done that better." It's like that for the like chimp paradox. Have you yeah, read that? Yeah, chimp paradox. Exactly <laughs> like that. Exactly I'm like, like that. Chimp, be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Human, come back out. <laughs> I've just got a chimp and a gorilla, though. That's the only <laughs> problem. <laughs> the human's gone. Moved out. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me and having this conversation. I think it's a really important conversation to be had and hopefully we can keep talking about it for years to come. Um, but thank you for joining thank me. You, thank you, Neil. Thanks.